All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to yet another uh, wonderful program uh, hosted by the World Affairs Council. We want to thank you all for joining us on this wonderful Tuesday afternoon. Um, we have a great guest who I have heard uh, speak at other councils, and he has generously uh, provided his time to talk about an area that he is focused on. Um, he's done a lot of things, but uh, we will uh, learn more about Dr. Pillar and his views on Iran. Um, and it will be moderated by uh, one of our local university professors, um, Dr. Suzan Siavashi. Um, just some opening remarks before we get into that. And I, I wanna do is the least amount of talking so that we could hear from our special guest and our moderator. Uh, we're always looking to um, gain people's uh, membership and their support. So if you look in the chat room, you will see that there is a link to look at the various levels of membership we have. And we need your support. Um, I know many of you are tuning in on Facebook Live um, and also tuning in for the first time. So thank you for your support and your donation is also appreciated. Uh, whatever amount is appreciated, and uh, we um, uh, we we thank you for your continued support and everyone who has tuned in um, to listen to this presentation. Uh, we thank you. I know Ambassador Cragen is is on, uh, and Councilman John Courage, who's a good friend of the council, has joined in, and we we also have Congressman uh, Chip Roy's office who is tuning in. Um, and we're very thankful. This couldn't have been done without the support of the Iran Project. We really appreciate their support and bringing programs like this to uh, viewers like you and to communities like ours. Uh, we're also thankful to uh, Ben Ramirez and Marty Johnson. Ben's with World Affairs Council Austin. Marty is with uh, World Affairs Council um, of South Texas based in Corpus Christi. So uh, we will be doing more joint efforts to uh, promote programs like this. So we really appreciate that. Of course, the University of Incarnate Word is sponsoring this webinar and they will through the month of July. So we appreciate them. It's a cost that we don't have to worry about. So we appreciate the University of Incarnate Word. And also our promoting pro partner, last but not least, the Meher Foundation, right here in San Antonio, they promote and celebrate Persian arts and culture. And let me tell you, if nothing brings people together more than food, I don't know what else does, but uh, particularly with, um, with Persian food. So uh, I have attended several of their events. Uh, so we thank uh, the Meher Foundation and their members for, for uh, joining us today. Um, Dr. Pillar is a senior fellow at Georgetown University uh, in the security uh, uh, for, uh, I'm sorry, he's a senior fellow uh, in the security studies at Georgetown University. He's committed 28 years of service uh, in the intelligence community. His resume is uh, very impressive and it's gonna be in the chat room, but just some highlights uh, that he was a national intelligence officer um, in for Near East and South Asia. Uh, he served in the National Intelligence Council. Um, he was an executive assistant to William Webster. Um, he served in Vietnam. Thank you for your service, sir. We appreciate that. He's written a couple books, which I'm gonna have to look into because uh, Negotiating Peace, which was written some time ago, talks about uh, the bargaining process involved in peace. So I, I look forward to checking that out. He's also written a book about terrorism in the U.S. right after 9-11. So those were some exciting books, and you will soon hear from him. Um, last but not least, our wonderful moderator, um, uh, Suzanne uh, Siavashi. She's a professor of political science at Trinity University. She's a product of OSU but she came down to Texas as fast as she could. And I know she has spoken at the Rotary Club, which I'm a member of, and also has supported the World Affairs Council before. She's also written a book 
um, which has uh, received some awards. Um, one specifically the uh, called Montezari, the life and thoughts of Iran's revolutionary Ayatollah. She's also been recently announced the editor in chief of the Journal of Association um, of Iranian Studies, uh, which is a very uh, important and academic piece in the um, academia side of the Iranian community. So thank you all for joining us. We will have questions. Please filter all of your questions into the Q&A box. Um, you're welcome to provide comments in the chat, but the Q&A is uh, specifically for questions. Please put them all in there. Uh, Dr. Siavashi, after the presentation, we'll look at those questions and ask questions. We will also have questions from our Facebook Live audience. So having said all of that, enjoy this wonderful presentation uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Pick, uh, Dr. Piller and uh, Dr. Siavashi, if you could please take it away. And you're on mute. Oh, you want me to start? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's uh, a pleasure to be here and, and especially a big pleasure to uh, be in a conversation with Dr. Piller. Uh, I won't, uh, I will keep my question uh, for later and without further ado, I will uh, ask uh, um, that Dr. Piller kindly share his um, uh, expertise and knowledge with us. Dr. Piller, please. Thank you. It, it's a pleasure to uh, meet with this group. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk some about uh, U.S. policy toward Iran as it's shaped up over the last couple of years, the Iranian reactions to it, uh, some about the current situation in Iran as it relates to public health and the economy and politics, and then uh, mention a few uh, kind of current diplomatic things going on. The uh, defining uh, document, if you will, of U.S.-Iranian policy up until a couple of years ago uh, is the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, otherwise known as the Iran nuclear deal, which was concluded five years ago uh, in 2015. And as of two years ago, it had been successfully enforced for three years, and the Iranians uh, who had had under that agreement all of their possible pathways to a nuclear weapon closed uh, had been abiding by uh, its obligations uh, as verified by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And then things changed two years ago, or more specifically in May of 2018, when the Trump administration uh, renounced the JCPOA and reneged on the U.S. Uh, commitments under it as far as sanctions relief was concerned. Despite that renunciation, Iran continued compliance with its own obligations as far as its nuclear program is concerned for another year. Uh, the Iranian patience in that regard finally ran out a year later, about May of 2019, when the Trump administration escalated the matter and launched uh, what can be described as all-out economic warfare against Iran, going beyond the reinstatement of sanctions that had been uh, relieved or lifted after the JCPOA was signed and piled on more sanctions and basically has been doing in the subsequent uh, year plus everything it can to uh, cripple the Iranian economy. The Iranians have responded in a couple of ways. One, they have undertaken a series of incremental steps that exceed the limits uh, of their nuclear program as laid out in the JCPOA. They have repeatedly emphasized that these are reversible steps, and indeed they are, uh, and have coupled those steps with uh, repeated declarations that they are prepared to come back into compliance, full compliance with the agreement uh, as soon as the United States does. Uh, so that's one thing they've done. Uh, those steps have mainly involved uh, some exceeding of the limits on enrichment of uranium, uh, for example, they had been limited to 300 kilograms of uranium hexafluoride uh, enriched to a low level of less than 4%. They now have something like four times that amount. 
they've also slightly exceeded the enrichment level and they have some enriched as high as four and a half percent. There's, that still leaves them a long way from anything that would be needed for a run to a nuclear weapon, and there's no indication that they want to do that. They are clearly using this uh, as a bargaining chip, uh, basically the same way they used their nuclear program back before the JCPOA was negotiated, in which uh, they uh, you know, were ramping up things like uranium enrichment uh, as a form of uh, inducement for us and others to negotiate what eventually became the nuclear agreement. So that's one thing they've done. The other thing they've done is to be more active and more destructive uh, with regard to uh, kinetic and military activity in the region. And specifically, uh, we've had uh, some actions such as the sabotage of uh, some oil tankers off of the UAE coast in the Gulf of Oman. And then most dramatically last fall, there was an attack with the combination of drones and cruise missiles against a couple of Saudi oil facilities, the processing center at Abqaiq and the um, uh, oil field at Quraysh. Um, the, the Iranians had not been doing anything like that before. And in fact, they had been quite ca careful not to uh, start going after someone else's oil infrastructure since they knew that the obvious uh, uh, consequence of that is that someone would go after their oil infrastructure. Well, now that the Trump administration has try to destroy the Iranian oil trade entirely and bring oil, Iranian oil exports as close to zero as possible, uh, that has changed that incentive. Uh, the attack on the Saudi facility also was intended to send a message to the Saudis and the other Gulf Arabs as to what kind of damage they could expect, even if it were just collateral damage, if the United States or someone else were to come after Iran uh, with a military attack. Now, besides those two things, there have been other, there's other action that's been taking place in places like Iraq, but most of that, as far as the Iranians are concerned, uh, can be described as a kind of tit for tat for things that the United States has done to Iran. The most uh, forceful and significant of which was the assassination using a drone fired missile of Qasem Soleimani, who had been. Uh, the head of the so-called Quds Force of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. But he was really uh, more important than that. He wasn't just a military commander. He, had, uh, he was a major political as well as military figure. Uh, by some estimations, he may have been second in importance only to the supreme leader in shaping Iranian policy toward the region. The U.S. assassinated him while he was on a visit to Iraq uh, after he uh, uh, deboarded a plane at the Iraqi airport. Uh, the significance of Soleimani, it was reflected in the, the funeral processions that followed his death in Iran were uh, even just in Tehran. Uh, they were uh, estimated by uh, Western reporters, or at least a million people out in the streets, and there were other large demonstrations um, in recognition of Soleimani and some other Iranian cities as well. Inside Iran today, uh, the economic situation is quite grim. Um, this is due to a number of reasons. There's been a lot of mismanagement by the regime, but certainly the U.S. sanctions have had a very large part to do with that. Uh, over the last couple of years, the Iranian economy has been contracting. Uh, the Iranians have tried to uh, make as much of what they call a, a resistance economy as they can, not dependent on outside support or commerce. And they've had some success in doing that. Uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic began, uh, the IMF estimated that uh, the contraction of the Iranian economy might actually end before this, the end of this calendar year and start resuming some small growth. Uh, the pandemic has changed all that. Uh, now, the, uh, I saw a World uh, Bank estimate that uh, expects the Iranian economy for the whole year, 2020, will contract by something like 5.5%, with the only hope of uh, a beginning of expansion uh, put back to at least uh, 2021. Um, the, uh, the pandemic has hit Iran very hard. It was, as you may recall, one of the earliest hotspots outside of China. Um, Part of that reflects some mismanagement of the public health situation by the Iranian authorities, particularly in being slow to uh, cut off trade and travel 
with China, and that reflects how much uh, with the U.S. sanctions especially, the Iranians have relied on China as kind of an economic uh, lifeline. Um, at last count, the, uh, in terms of the COVID-19 figures, uh, there were almost 230,000 uh, official cases in Iran with deaths now numbering close to 11,000. Those numbers, like the corresponding numbers here in the United States and many other countries, are almost certainly a gross undercount. Uh, because there's been inadequate testing, the Iranians have been at least as far behind the testing curve as the U.S. has been. The U.S. sanctions have unquestionably made it a lot harder for the Iranians to cope with the virus and with the pandemic uh, for a number of reasons. There have been shortages of personal protective equipment, shortages of materials that go into the medicines that are manufactured in Iran, um, and shortages with regard to testing. Uh, this situation has led to some uh, appeals from some outsiders, including former cabinet level officials from Europe and the United States, appeals to the U.S. to ease up on the sanctions for the sake of uh, enabling the Iranians to deal better with this pandemic. And of course, since the virus knows, uh, uh, has no respect for international boundaries, that affects uh, the ability of the whole world to deal with the pandemic. The Trump administration doesn't see things that way. They have said that uh, there are exemptions, uh, exceptions, uh, humanitarian exceptions uh, for medicine and medically related equipment and supplies. While that is true, uh, it leaves unstated the effect of all the other sanctions, uh, the, the isolation of, the, of Iran from the world banking system and the other sec secondary sanctions that the U.S. has applied toward anyone, a manufacturer or a uh, financial institution of any nationality that does any business with Iran. And basically what's happened is that uh, foreign suppliers and financial institutions are simply scared to death of even inadvertently crossing some line that will cause the U.S. Treasury Department to come after them. And so despite these uh, exemptions uh, with regard to humanitarian and medical aid, they simply aren't being used. For example, uh, the U.S. said set up a channel supposedly for that purpose with the aid of the Swiss back at the beginning of this year. There's been only one uh, trial transaction that was placed back in January and there hasn't been another transaction since then. Um, the Trump administration is, is well aware of all this, but um, I, I think the best way to interpret the, the ultimate objective uh, of the administration's policy is regime change. And so from that standpoint, uh, suffering of the Iranian people uh, for whatever combination of medical and economic reasons uh, is seen as a good thing because it hastens the day when the administration hopes there will be sufficient uh, popular discontent that the regime uh, would be um, ousted or overturned. Uh, that dream of a regime change uh, really is probably as much of a dream as it's been for the four de decades uh, uh, history of the uh, Iranian Islamic Republic. We've had previous times when we saw popular unrest and demonstrations, and it never seemed to, got to the, get to the point of actually uh, toppling the regime. There certainly is a lot of popular discontent uh, with the sorts of mismanagement that I mentioned, but there's also a lot of realization on the part of ordinary Iranians uh, about how much the U.S. sanctions have to do with this. Uh, there is also not some you know, opposition movement or party or leadership that is waiting in the wings all set to take over uh, that could really become a credible government of Iran if there were more destabilization of the current regime. And for the most part, ordinary Iranians are just trying to get by rather than make a new revolution. And by the way, when you have a pandemic going on, uh, uh, when, um, uh, you know, things like uh, mass uh, uh, rallies in the street uh, or demonstrations in the street uh, only spread the disease. That's not a very good time to make the revolution. By the way, with regard to the, you know, the more recent trends uh, on the pandemic, uh, Iran, as I mentioned, was one of the earliest uh, countries hit. They, they reached a peak in cases back in March, and then they partly brought things under control. Uh, the uh, rate of infections, infections came down through March and April into early May, but since then it's sprung up, and more recently, just over the last three weeks or so, they have surpassed uh, 
you know, the new infection rates of, of more than 3,000 a day that they had reached back in March. So I think it's fair to say that Iran, having been part of the early first wave, is now experiencing a second wave. I'd like to comment on just uh, a few more recent things uh, on the diplomatic side. Uh, just within the past month, uh, the Trump administration uh, eliminated the last of the waivers to its secondary sanctions that it still had in place. And these were waivers to allow some cooperative work with the Iranians to make their nuclear program even more proliferation proof uh, than it otherwise would be under the JCPOA. Specifically, this has involved some work involving British, Russian, and, and Chinese technicians and companies uh, to uh, redesign one of the Iranian nuclear reactors so it would be a design that would not produce any more than trivial amounts of plutonium. It has involved taking uh, spent fuel off the hands of Iranians so they, and take it out of the country so they could not reprocess it even if they wanted to. And it has involved uh, supplying 20% enriched uh, fuel, which is needed for another reactor called the Tehran Research Reactor, which the Iranians have been using to make medical isotopes. And by supplying that fuel, that removes any excuse that the Iranians could possibly make for uh, having to uh, make their own 20% fuel, something they were doing back before the JCPOA was negotiated. So this measure is it's clearly counterproductive, what the administration did as far as non-proliferation is concerned, uh, but you have to uh, interpret it in terms of that objective of uh, not only trying to make things as unstable as possible in Iran, but also uh, to try to destroy what's left of the JCPOA uh, beyond any recognition. So even uh, a, a Biden administration coming into power next year uh, could not resurrect it. Another thing that the Trump administration has going uh, concerns uh, a couple of other provisions of the JCPOA. Uh, there was an arms embargo, a conventional arms embargo, uh, that's, that had been in effect and still is in effect against Iran. This was not designed, and this was a, a United Nations uh, sanctioned arms embargo, uh, this was not designed to solve uh, any particular conventional arms trade problem, and indeed Iran is, is actually kind of a minor part of that. Uh, the U.S. as a seller and Saudi Arabia as a buyer are far bigger parts of the arms trade in the Middle East, as are some others like the United Arab Emirates. But rather, it was just one more nuclear sanction, uh, one more uh, incentive uh, for the Iranians uh, to negotiate uh, restrictions uh, on their nuclear program, which in fact, of course, they did um, with the um, negotiation of the JCPOA. Uh, so by that logic, the arms embargo should have ended uh, as soon as the JCPOA came, came into effect, but the U.S. negotiators under the Obama administration resisted doing away with it right away, and uh, the compromise was to have it go away after five years. Well, that five-year point comes this October. The Trump administration says, uh, we don't want to eliminate that. We want to keep the arms embargo uh, in place. Um, others uh, who are parties to agreement, especially the Russians and Chinese, uh, have opposed that. Uh, and they say they would, probably the Russians would veto any new UN uh, resolution to that effect. So the Trump administration has said, as a fallback, they would do something else. <laughs> they would invoke uh, what's called the uh, snapback provisions of the JCPOA. This was a clever bit of uh, diplomatic engineering designed to reassure people that if Iran started to cheat on the agreement, the sanctions would come back into force without being prevented by, say, a Security Council veto by the likes of Russia or China. And it says that if any party to the uh, JCPOA uh, felt that Iran was, was not abiding by the agreement, they could declare that and the sanctions would automatically come back into effect unless you had a new UN Security Council resolution that said they should not. And of course, if there were a new resolution, then the United States or anyone else could veto it. 
Well, the obvious uh, complication of this strategy is that the United States administration two years ago renounced the agreement, withdrew from it. Uh, the Trump administration was quite explicit. We don't want to have anything to do with this agreement anymore. And yet now they are saying, we are still a participant in the agreement for purposes of invoking the snapback procedure. Well, the other parties to the accord uh, consider this, um, well, to put it mildly, as, as rather absurd reasoning. The Russians have been quite explicit about this. Nonetheless, uh, it's not out of the question that this Trump administration maneuver could succeed because uh, the likes of Russia and China you know, could not wield a, a veto that could prevent it. And if the U.S. Uh, got the cooperation of whoever is the uh, then president of the Security Council to declare uh, what the U.S. wanted it to declare, uh, this could happen. And you look at some of the uh, countries that are going to hold the presidency of the council in the next few months, uh, including Niger and St. Vincent and Grenadines, uh, it's uh, not hard to imagine that the U.S. administration could pressure them to do exactly that. Well, if that happens, we would have nothing short of a constitutional crisis in the UN Security Council because parties like the Russians and Chinese would basically ignore the reimposition of sanctions. They would uh, continue to uh, trade with the Iranians, uh, and we'd basically have a mess. Um, there, I would, I would come close to ending on on a somewhat more positive note. Uh, some of the observers of the U.S.-Iranian scene have have noted what seems to be a relaxation of tensions, at least a little bit, over the last couple of months. And that is featured in particular, there was a prisoner exchange just uh, three or four weeks ago, in which an American named Michael White, who had been incarcerated by the Iranians, was freed. And in the other direction, there were a couple of Iranians, a scientist and a doctor, who had been held on sanctions violation charges, who had been freed in the other direction. This is the second such prisoner exchange that has occurred. We had an earlier one several months earlier that involved a Princeton graduate student had been, who had been held. Um, I, one could be hopeful that there might be at least a couple more of these exchanges because there are at least a couple more American citizens who have been held by the Iranians really on trumped up charges as kind of bargaining chips. And perhaps we'll see more of that. But meanwhile, you know, the underlying tension, I don't want to understate how severe that has been. Uh, and I would still say we, we have a, a hazard of, of this confrontation uh, breaking out into uh, a war that neither side is looking for right now. And either, even though neither side is looking for it, uh, uh, such an escalation of tensions into outright fighting could occur in, in any of two or three ways. Uh, you could have simply an accident, some encounter at sea, for example, in the Persian Gulf. And you might recall there was an incident back uh, during the Obama administration when a couple of U.S. Navy small craft strayed into Iranian territorial waters. It seemed to have been an accident. They had difficulties with their navigational equipment. Well, the Iranians did what we obviously would do if uh, Iranian naval craft strayed into our territorial waters. They seized the, the boats and the crew. Fortunately, we had a, a channel of communications as a byproduct of the negotiations on the nuclear agreement at the foreign minister level. And John Kerry got on the phone to his Iranian counterpart, Javad Zarif, and within 24 hours, we had our, our vessels and our crew back. Uh, it's one can think about what would happen under current circumstances if you had a similar encounter, and, and I'm not optimistic that it would turn out anywhere near the same way. You might have a simple miscalculation as well, that either the U.S. or the Iranians uh, uh, miscalculate the, the tolerance or the, the red lines, if you will, on the other side. Uh, bear in mind that right now we still have a situation from Iran's point of view uh, with regard to the sanctions that is not uh, indefinitely tolerable. Uh, they want to see a change. They're not satisfied with the status quo, and that's part of what we saw uh, with those attacks on the Saudi oil facilities last fall. Uh, again, there might be a miscalculation on their part as to how much uh, the U.S. administration can withstand. And finally, you might have some wild card. The one I worry about is uh, the Netanyahu government in Israel, which is going to face all kinds of uh, flack on the annexation issue in the Palestinian territories, uh, and to do something to stir up 
or to escalate the U.S.-Iranian confrontation, perhaps with some military action of their own, uh, is certainly not out of the realm of possibility. But we can hope that none of these things come to pass and that there will be more uh, of a positive sort, such as we saw with the prisoners exchange. But let me stop there, and I look forward to uh, our discussions and uh, questions. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Piller, for uh, your very thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, uh, I have a question uh, that is broader. Uh, you mostly talk about the JCPOA on and about Trump administration. My question is that if you look at uh, foreign policy scholars, those who write on Iran and write about foreign policy of Iran and its intention, you see basically two opposite almost uh, point of view. There are those uh, who argue that Iran is fundamentally offensive um, its intention. It's a revolutionary state that would like to, uh, or a revisionist state that would like to change the balance of power and uh, basically destroy the equilibrium in, in the region. And uh, it has hegemonic intention. Uh, it would like to dominate the region. Um, and therefore, uh, it's also anti-Israeli and anti-Sunni uh, government. And uh, therefore, it has to be contained uh, even uh, uh, through military means or otherwise. And the best uh, scenario uh, from some people's point of view is to just change the regime so revolutionary outlook will go away. Then uh, on the other side, you have those who argue that Iran is a strategically lonely country. It is surrounded by countries that are armed to the heat, uh, or they are part of the coalition uh, with bigger uh, powers, uh, or they have uh, nuclear weapons. And therefore, uh, Iran foreign policy, even though it's opportunistic in some way, but it's fundamentally defensive. Uh, that Iran doesn't necessarily want to uh, dominate the, re uh, the region, but would like to find a place for itself um, that it thinks it deserves as a big country. Uh, and from their point of view, it's, uh, it's not Iran that is uh, a threat to Saudi Arabia or Israel, it's the other way around, more or less. Now, uh, you sort of uh, gave a presentation that uh, had element of both, but um, would you tell us that if you were uh, an advisor to the next president of the United States, whoever that might be, what would you say? What, what is your position on this point? I mean, which, which, which of these two schools do you fall um, or lean toward? And then what would you say to the president in order to best serve American interests? Well, all of the Iranian behavior over at least the last couple of decades falls far more in your second scenario rather than the first one. That is to say uh, that the, the Iranian behavior has been largely reactive. Uh, part of the way you phrased your question, indeed, uh, is partly an answer to it, that it, uh, uh, the Iranians uh, see themselves surrounded by um, rivals, in some cases you know, enemies that use very strong uh, words in talking about Iran, that are armed uh, much more fully and extensively than they are. I mean, just, you know, the, the UAE Air Force, for example, is just by itself uh, 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 is vastly superior to any of the manned air force that uh, Iran has and would, uh, in a one-on-one -on -one fight, would almost certainly come out on top. But just to, to to use some examples of what's taken place around the region and what's often uh, cited in terms of Iranian behavior we don't like to emphasize the reactive nature of it. Let me just mention three places. Syria, the Syrian civil war broke out. Uh, Syria has been, still is, the only really reliable Arab ally that Iran has in the entire region. Uh, this goes back to when uh, both the Syrian regime and the Iranian regime uh, were arch rivals of uh, of the Saddam Hussein regime uh, in Iraq. Uh, so they are making good on their alliance and in cooperation with the Russians have uh, helped keep their ally uh, Assad in power. And the Assads have been in power, father and son for 50 years in Syria. So that's, that's hardly you know, overturning 
the existing order of things, it's maintaining the existing order. And then in Iraq, uh, one of the huge experiences uh, that have shaped the thinking of Iranian decision makers was the eight year Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s, extremely destructive. And so from the Iranian point of view, one of the main aspects of Iranian security that is very important to them is to make sure that nothing like Saddam Hussein's invasion of Iraq in 1980 ever happens again. And so they place a very high priority in um, uh, exerting their influence in Iraq and seeing to it that they have at least a reasonably cordial regime in Baghdad, uh, not necessarily you know, an ally, certainly not a patron, but one that's not going to wage war against Iran again. And a lot of the stuff that you see going on in Iraq in terms of the influence in the militias and so on, that's, that's the groundwork for it. And then finally, Yemen. Uh, uh, the, the, the Yemeni civil war broke out, and the biggest intervener, of course, by far, is Saudi Arabia, and to a lesser extent, the United Arab Emirates. Uh, Yemen has been turned into a humanitarian disaster, uh, overwhelmingly because of the Saudi air war that, uh, that continues to get waged. Uh, the Iranians have reacted to that by providing some aid, you know, much, much smaller than anything that the Saudis and Emiratis have thrown into the, the mix, uh, to the so-called Houthis who are on the, the other side uh, of, of this war. And so it's been a pretty cheap way uh, for the Iranians to react to uh, this large military adventure by Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia which has been extremely costly to Saudi Arabia. And, and by uh, helping shore up the Houthis, this has been a way of, of bleeding their, their cross-regional rival. But that's, all of those things are reactive. You know, in the first few years after the Iranian revolution, there may have been, and I think there was, more thinking among the revolutionary leadership that, and this was almost like uh, the, the Trotskyites after the Bolshevik revolution in Russia. Uh, the belief that they needed to see like-minded revolutions in neighboring states in order for their own to survive. Well, they didn't see such revolutions, and they have survived now for over 40 years. And so their situation is uh, uh, far more one of, uh, of uh, reaction and trying to you know, secure a place in a region. They see themselves as a major actor, but it's not a matter of revolution and hegemony. And then for your second question, uh, you know, what's the advice to be given? Well, uh, I think any advice that I gave to the current administration would pretty much fall on deaf ears. You, you heard my description uh, of what it's all about, and, and I think it's, it's already proven to be a dead end and a futile one. Uh, in, on the nuclear side, uh, we've just got more nuclear activity rather than less by the Iranians. On the regional activity side, we have more destructive activity like the attacks on the Saudi oil facilities rather than less. And finally, I didn't really go into this in my earlier remarks, Politically, we've got more hardline politics in Tehran. Uh, the pragmatists, uh, the more moderate elements represented by President Rouhani, who negotiated uh, the agreement and his foreign minister, Zarif, have been discredited in Iran uh, because of the U.S. reneging on it. And the hardliners are saying, we told you so. Uh, you can't strike any deals with the untrustworthy Americans. Uh, well, that's not the kind of political development that, that helps us as well. If we had a change of leadership in Washington, then basically my, my immediate advice, it would be my advice to a President Biden, although he's already said this is what he would do if he wins the election, is to uh, bring the United States back into full compliance uh, with the JCPOA, uh, the nuclear agreement, and then use that as a basis for addressing our, our other points of difference that we have with Tehran. It would be easy to, uh, to work out the timing on this, given that Iran has, has exceeded those nuclear limits, as I described before. Uh, a new US president could say, okay, uh, I'm hereby uh, coming back into compliance with the agreement. We're lifting the sanctions that should have been lifted, and they will stay lifted as long as Iran fulfills its promise to say in the next three months, you know, some fairly short period, uh, come fully back into compliance as verified by the IAEA with all of its nuclear obligations. Uh, the Iranians have repeatedly indicated that's exactly what they want to have happen, and that would be my advice uh, to any new president. Uh, thank you. Um, there are several questions, and I will go in the order that I receive them. 
but also maybe combine some of them together. But before I do that, I would like to read something that Ambassador Pagan said, and he commented that he that he used your book uh, on terrorism in his class, and it was very helpful. Great, thank you. <laughs> Uh, now, in terms of questions, uh, as I said, maybe I can combine some of these things. Uh, someone asked, what do you think are the goals of Ayatollah for Iran? And connected to that, uh, you can also answer this question, is uh, what do you think, uh, what are your thoughts about Iranian influence over uh, government and society in Iraq? Um, and whether there is any regional cooperation between Iran and its neighbors. I'm sorry, the second question was it about Iraq? Is that what you said? Uh, yes. Uh, I, what, uh, what kind of influence does okay. Iran have over Iraq, both on, in terms of the society and on the government? Okay. Uh, well, address that one first. Uh, there is considerable influence in these militia groups. Uh, uh, that, that have been in the news. And the Iraqi gov government or government, since we've had now a succession of prime ministers, um, has had to continue to rely quite a bit on the militias, including those, and there, this isn't true of all of them, but including those that um, have had links with Iran for internal security purposes to deal with you know, the, you know, the remnants of ISIS, uh, you know, the the physical entity of the ISIS caliphate is no more, but it, the group is still out there uh, as an insurgency, you know, as a terrorist threat. Uh, and so, although the the Iraqis have tried to uh, integrate those militias more fully into the, the more formal security structure of Iraq, it's been a it, it's been a slow process. Uh, you'll find different views of different Iraqis toward the Iranian presence and Iranian influence, but I would say the, the sort of mainstream consensus view is, uh, uh, has two elements. One, it's the mirror image of what I described of what Iran wants to see in Iraq. That is to say, a cordial enough relationship that they would never have a repeat of that horrible war in the 1980s, from which Iraqis suffered a lot as well as Iranians. Uh, and secondly, uh, they would not want to be uh, basically a, a battlefield or a, a, a field of competition between the United States and Iran. And they'd like to see both U.S. and Iranian influence and presence uh, reduced. Uh, it's hard to do just one and not the other. Uh, if, I think uh, a lot of Iraqis see uh, the relationship with Iran as a counterweight uh, to the continued influence of the U.S. and vice versa. Uh, so that's something that you know our policymakers have to keep in mind, and uh, ought to have in mind in, in shaping future U.S. policy toward Iraq. As far as you know, the overall, uh, I think the question was about you know, the the intentions or objectives. Uh, I assume of Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, the supreme leader. Um, it's to preserve the revolution, to preserve the uh, current form of government. Um, not necessarily in all its details, and, and uh, Hamenei uh, is aged and uh, semi-infirmed, and all the expectations are we will have a, a new supreme leader selected sometime in the next few years. Um, so I think uh, his main objective, besides uh, defending Iran against uh, undue foreign influence or much less things like military attack or incursion, is to keep the current political order together um, uh, in, a, in a form that uh, can't be said to be, well, the revolution fell apart. I was muted. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Piller. Uh, uh, there is another question by Mr. Amir Samandi, and he asked about how do you see Iran's relationship with Russia? particularly in light of reports about Taliban, uh, paying, paying money to Taliban for killing U.S. troops. Uh, do you see the Russians meddling in a similar way with any troops or actors in Iran? Well, it's a complicated relationship. I think, I think 
for both Moscow and Tehran, what, mo what most of them would focus on right now in terms of the relationship is probably uh, centered on Syria. Uh, given the major role that both Iran and Russia have played as allies of the Assad regime in propping up that regime during the nine years of the Syrian civil war. Now they, they've been on the same side in that conflict, but their objectives are not necessarily identical. Uh, and indeed they are, they're really uh, competitors for influence uh, in Damascus, influence with the Assad regime. And I think uh, we will probably see more indications of uh, perhaps some of that competition uh, coming up in the months ahead. Uh, as far as on the Afghan end and, and you know, the, the reports about the, uh, the bounty payments, uh, I haven't really thought that through as, in terms of the Iranian angle. Uh, the Iranians, obviously, with their long border with Afghanistan, uh, have had major concerns uh, and, and uh, worries uh, security-wise. Uh, you know, their own diplomats and personnel uh, have fallen victim to the likes of the Taliban. Uh, so if, if the Russians are doing business with the Taliban, I, I don't think that's, uh, that's certainly not a, uh, anything that is going to reassure the Iranians. If anything, it's, uh, it's an extra worry for them. But I, I expect uh, analysts and officials in Tehran are now just trying to figure out and scratch their head about uh, what the Russians are really up to in Afghanistan and what, if anything, it means for Iran. Thank you. I think uh, we have time for one more question and then I have to hand it back to Armand. And the question is, why did President Obama's Iran deal lead to pallets of billions of dollars cash in airplanes to Iran? What did they think that Iran would do with the money? One of the biggest fallacies, and it's certainly been perpetrated by political opponents of Mr. Obama, is that there were pallets of cash that were some part, some way part of the Iran deal. They weren't. Uh, the cash was belated um, a refund of money that Iran, going back to the time of the Shah, even before the revolution, had paid for a bunch of US-made aircraft when the Shah was buying military hardware right and left. Uh, and were never delivered because the revolution occurred and, and we never delivered the planes. So that's Iranian money. Uh, it never was our money. And indeed, you know, if you set that aside, uh, the, the sanctions relief that really was part of the nuclear agreement, uh, almost all that was Iranian money as well, with you know, frozen assets in various places overseas. And most of it uh, had already been accounted for in terms of uh, commercial deals that uh, the Iranians had made with various parties around the world. So there never was, never was any big windfall for the Iranians. Uh, what, what they hoped for uh, in terms of economics and finance was more of a restoration of, of normal commerce and to get the economic benefit from that. Um, Palace of Cash had nothing to do with it. They didn't even get at that, partly uh, just because of the the hesitation of the private sector that was occurring even under the Obama administration, but then partly after the Trump administration took power and even before their formal renunciation of the agreement in May uh, 2018, they were already violating, that the US administration was violating the commitment under the JCPOA and UN Security Council Resolution 2231 not to inhibit normal commerce uh, and economic transactions with Iran. So no, there's been no big windfall, and um, uh, so nothing follows from any uh, you know, pallets of cash. Well, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Keller. Uh, it was very educational and inspiring, and there were lots of good questions. And now I'm going to turn the podium to Arman, and we'll say goodbye to you, Dr. Keller, and to everyone else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Siavashi. Thank you, Dr. Pillar. What a, uh, we, we've had so many questions and I, uh, out of respect for people's time, um, we weren't able to ask all of them, but what Dr. Pillar and Dr. Siavashi have 
uh, agreed is we will follow up with an email for those who have registered to um, provide their contacts so you could ask them directly. Um, I know Mortada uh, and, and uh, Patrick, I believe, we had some uh, follow-up questions and we couldn't get to those, so I, I apologize with that. I do want to uh, make sure to thank the Iran Project uh, and uh, they are an organization that provides a balanced analysis of the current situation in the Middle East. Uh, they're dedicated to a balanced objective and bipartisan uh, approach uh, to preventing Iran from uh, acquiring uh, nuclear weapons. They've been very good to work with, good to work with as, and I know that the organization also works with many other World Affairs Council uh, Dr. Pillar, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for your insight, for your years of service uh, to, to the country as, a, as in the military and also uh, in intelligence. We really appreciate that. Um, we will have a recording of this sent to everybody as well as we will pull it on social media. So thank you uh, for tuning in. Also, thanks to our Facebook audience uh, for, for tuning in. We noticed a lot of people from the Mayor Foundation. Thank you for joining us. Uh, World Affairs Council, Austin, Corpus Christi. Uh, we appreciate it for tuning in. UIW for your sponsorship. Trinity for, for letting us borrow, Dr. Siavashi. Uh, Dr. Pillar, when you're in San Antonio next, we're gonna have to take you to Pasha when you come down and, and enjoy okay. some good food. Good. Um, again, we, we are successful because of your support. Uh, and we would appreciate any donations, uh, any, anywhere, $5, $10, $500, whatever is uh, important to you. There's a link in the chat room for you to make that donation. We appreciate it, as well as membership information. We've got a great event coming up on July the 14th in honor of Bastille Day, so please tune into that. Uh, and we also have several Instagram Lives coming up including with Dr. Katsui, one of your colleagues at Trinity, uh, will be joining us, as well as Carlos Maestas, who's a storyteller here in San Antonio. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you to my board for tuning in. And we appreciate your time uh, with us on this very important topic. And we wish you all the best and have a great afternoon.